If this one goes up. Okay. Let's off camera action. Um, okay, our speaker today is a uh, soon to be doctor, right? Amanda Yuxel from uh, Brooklyn Polytechnic. This is called Polytechnic. Polytechnic University. And uh, she's going to be talking about. Um, Diversity multiplexing results in corporate networks and is apparently a new result in security in VHS. So let her talk. Thank you. Um, so thanks for coming. Um, and um, yeah, I will be talking about reliability rate and security issues in uh, cooperative uh, networks. And as Lolita said, um, our um, approach in um, rate and reliability will be diversity multiplexing trade-off, and we will also uh, consider the security issues. Um, in, um, and of course, uh, our main aim at this point is to study wireless channels. And um, every day, uh, we demand a lot of uh, information from wireless <coughs> channels. We're utilizing more and more um, the wireless channels more. And we want these applications to be available through our cell phones. We want them available when we are riding at a very high speed uh, with our cars. And we want, the, for example, the video information we're sending to be crisp. We want um, the sound to be very clear, um, but we have very high demands from this wireless channel, but actually the wireless medium is very unreliable because there is this multipass propagation and um, signals may add destructively, and actually um, it's always a probabilistic event what you receive um, at the receiver side. And also, the bandwidth is limited. So we want a lot from the wireless channel. On the other hand, it's a very limited um, channel. So it's always an issue um, how you can increase reliability and rate at the physical layer. And actually, um, communications do not always happen in a very innocent environment. Uh, there might be some passive listeners um, eavesdropping upon you. So uh, you also have security issues in your communication networks. Um, so um, motivating uh, the problem, I'd like to say that uh, when we're studying the um, reliability uh, and rate aspects, our main uh, measure, uh, performance measure, will be the diversity multiplexing trade-off. Um, so at first, I will give a diver brief diversity multiplexing trade-off definition. Uh, and thank you. And um, uh, we will go through four different uh, examples, uh, four different cooperative uh, system examples through the system. And we will, uh, we will go through uh, one by one from a diversity multiplexing point of view. So at, uh, the first example is that uh, we will uh, have single antenna nodes and multiple relays in the system, and we'll assume that uh, the relays are full duplex. And um, then trying to uh, make the system um, more general, we will allow uh, multiple antennas on nodes, but, to, but just to keep the problem simple for a while, we will assume only one relay in the system, and we'll still think that the relay is full duplex. Now we'll ch and then we'll change the problem a little bit, and then assume that the relays are half duplex, and see uh, what changes in the system. So in the first two problems, we'll assume full duplex operation at the relay to see the fundamental limitations we have in a cooperative system, um, and. Uh, and then we'll uh, relax this assumption and also study the half duplex one. And finally, we will uh, discuss the multiple access relay channel. And uh, briefly, I will uh, talk about the security issues uh, present in a cooperative uh, system. Uh, I'll talk about the rate equivocation rate region and um, talk about an achievable rate equivocation rate region in a uh, relay channel with a wire tapper. I'll conclude my talk and just give some future directions. Um, as uh, you might uh, know, uh, the diversity multiplexing trade-off is first established for multiple input, multiple output systems. And um, it, um, for the multiple input, multiple output systems, uh, we, uh, we can utilize multiple antennas at both sides, the transmitter side and the receiver side. And this will bring in some spatial diversity gains into the system. So uh, if we utilize all independent channels in the system to repeat the same information, then we can increase the reliability of the system. And that reliability is measured with the diversity gain. And uh, it's, uh, the, the diversity gain, we see that it is uh, the probability of, if the diversity gain is large, the probability of error decays very fast with SNR. 
On the other hand, in a multiple input, multiple output system, you may not want to use all independent fading channels in between your transmitter and receivers for sending uh, the same information. You might as well uh, decouple uh, these channels and send independent information through them. And uh, this way you can increase your multiplexing gain. And uh, if you uh, and multiplexing gain here is denoted by the little r and if you you can uh, choose to increase your uh, target data rate of the system as r log of SNR when you're increasing uh, increasing um, SNR. So it is a high SNR analysis and uh, the uh, diversity gain and the multiplexing gain uh, are related to the reliability and uh, rate performances of your system. But of course, if you use all your independent channels to repeat the same information, you won't be able to send that much of independent information, so you'll lose your rate. And if you pump in more information into the system, you will lose diversity. And of course, there is a trade-off between them, and that was established in 2002. And uh, the diversity multiplexing trade-off is a piecewise linear function connecting the points k and d sub mn of k, which is given here. For example, this figure shows an example 2 by 2 MIMO system, and we see that if the multiplexing gain r is small, we can obtain high, multi uh, high diversity gain, and if the diversity gain is small, we can obtain high multiplexing gain values. And um, of course, uh, MIMO systems are well established. We know that they can provide high diversity gains, high multiplexing gains. But on the other hand, there exist the, these cooperative systems. And um, so when, when a um, transmitter transmits information in a wireless medium, because of the wireless broadcast advantage, all the nearby nodes may hear this information at the same time uh, without any cost. So uh, when they hear this, uh, when they, you know, for example, when a source transmits message, um, the relay, which is um, nearby, can hear that information and process this information and forward it to that destination. The destination, um, this way, making use of the relay, can combine the direct signal from the source and through the relay and actually do something better than just listening to, um, to the direct link only. Although um, the inter-user channel is noisy from source to the relay or from relay to the destination, um, this actually this system can behave like a transmit antenna array and uh, actually provide um, diversity gains in, into the um, add uh, diversity gains into the system. Of course, any any gain you obtain. Um, in, in a system can be interpreted in terms of um, other gains. You might use that gain for higher rates or increased battery life. Um, or also in a cellular network, you can use it for extended coverage as well. Um, corporate, um, so on one side, there is this diversity multiplexing trade-off established for MIMO systems. And on the other hand, there is um, cooperative systems. So the natural question to ask next is, uh, what is the um, diversity multiplexing trade-off behavior of cooperative systems? We know that when everyone has a single antenna, cooperative systems are a are reasonable, are, uh, are good substitutes for MIMO systems. So uh, what are their uh, diversity multiplexing trade-off performances? This problem has been, uh, has been studied um, extensively uh, in the literature. For example, um, when cooperation emerged with uh, Lenneman, uh, Say, and Warnell paper in 2004, um, they studied um, the orthogonal transmission. Um, um, they assumed source transmits in the first, time, uh, first half of the time and the relay uh, transmits in the second half of the time, and they assumed one relay. Uh, for example, uh, Azarian, El Gamal, and Schneider assumed half duplex relay operation and uh, suggested some um, diversity multiplexing um, trade-off results. And also, um, space-time coding, when, they, uh, when uh, the system has multiple relays, space-time co coding uh, diversity multiplex, space-time coding has been applied for this cooperation system, and then its diversity multiplexing trade-off performance has been uh, calculated. And also, uh, similar analysis is done uh, when there's a bunch of relays and you just select one out of it. Uh, but all these um, um, papers in the literature consider, um, um, they compare their results with the fact that um, all these relays together with the source can form a transmit antenna array, or all the relays together with the receiver side behave like a receive antenna array. 
But actually, when you have multiple relays, the system has a higher potential. Because, for example, in a 2x2 MIMO system, you have a total of four antennas, and um, you obtain a 2x2 MIMO diversity multiplexing trade-off. So um, a natural question to ask next is, why should I be limiting myself to think about uh, the system as a transmit antenna array, three times one MIMO, or one times three MIMO, when I have a total of four antennas? Why cannot I um, think about the system as a two by two MIMO? So can such a cooperative system imitate a two by two MIMO system? Or if I have multiple antennas, say, um, M antenna, um, M relays here and M relays here. Can I, uh, can I imitate a M plus one times M plus one MIMO behavior? Um, the answer to this question depends on the locations of, uh, of the nodes. So before I go any further and give an answer, I'd like to motivate the channel model assumptions uh, we make um, throughout our work. So we say that if two nodes are, uh, are not close to each other, then the line of sight component between those two nodes are not strong enough. Um, so the channel in between those two nodes are Rayleigh, and th thus we say that these two nodes are in their Rayleigh zones. But if two nodes are very close to each other, let's say for, uh, closer than a threshold distance epsilon, then they have a very strong line of sight component in between. So actually, uh, the Rayleigh channel model breaks at this point, and um, because of, um, the editor white Gaussian noise component dominates, and uh, we say that these two, uh, two nodes are in AWGN zone, uh, are within their AWGN zones, and we assume that the channel is editor white Gaussian noise. Um, I'd like to note that actually this discrete model actually captures all the properties of the Ricene model. I'm not going to go through the mathematical details, but if I were to make the analysis for a Ricean channel uh, with, uh, for variable Ricean factor k, then everything would boil down to this um, discrete um, assumption. So. Um, Depending on uh, where, the, uh, where the nodes are, I will be talking about two different cooperative systems. The first one is the non-clustered one, and the second one will be the clustered one. For the non-clustered one, I assume that all two nodes, any, any two nodes, are in their Rayleigh zone. So everyone here is everyone else, and all the channels are Rayleigh. But when the system is clustered, I assume that source and the first relay are very close to each other, so the channel in between is at a white Gaussian noise, and the second relay and the destination is very close to each other, so again, the channel in between is at a white Gaussian noise. But this cluster, I assume, uh, in a clustered system, is going to be far from the second cluster, the receive cluster, so all the channels from the transmit cluster to the uh, receive cluster will be considered um, Rayleigh really fading. Um, um, so when the, um, for, the, for this clustered system, uh, we assume when the um, channels are really, all really channels are independent and uh, quasi-static, there is also uh, path loss in the system, and um, when the channels in AWGN, we assume the fixed channel gains given by these two amounts. Um, so continuing on, um, first of all, I'm I said our aim is to compare the cooperative system with the MIMO system. So uh, first of all, we ne need to find an upper bound. Um, uh, information theoretically, we have the maximum flow minimum cut bounds, uh, which uh, actually put an upper bound onto the achievable rate of a system. Um, so using that theorem, we can actually uh, prove that um, we can get a diversity multiplexing trade-off upper bound uh, on, uh, on the system when the target rate data rate of the system is um, um, increasing by multiplexing gain R. So um, the um, information theoretic cuts at upper bounds are well established and with little modifications you can use it for um, diversity multiplexing trade-off too. So for the um, for the clustered uh, system, we look at the cut sets and we will be finding an upper bound. Um, for example, for this clustered system, when we look at the first cut set, that, uh, the, that first cut set idealizes the system as a one transmit antenna, three uh, receive antenna um, uh, system. 
and we write the uh, mutual information uh, mutual information expression for that uh, for that cut set, and we find this value. And similarly, for for the third cut set, uh, that cut set idealizes the system as three transmit antennas and one receive antenna. Um, and uh, the mutual information for that cut set is upper bounded with this expression. So when we look at those two expressions, for example, only the first, let's look at the first one, we see that it is larger than this particular amount, which is actually the capacity of a particular editor white Gaussian noise channel. And its multiplexing gain uh, is one, because this whole term, this whole upper bound mutual information expression is on the order of log SNR. So, uh, multiplexing gain is at most one because it can only grow like log of SNR at high SNR and it is larger than an the white Gaussian uh, channel capacity value. So this means that actually um, the probability of error is, uh, is insignificant and um, that's why we can say that the diversity multiplexing trade-off for these two cut sets is actually infinity for all multiplexing gains up to one. So basically through this cut set we know how to communicate error free. Um, so we are left with the second cut set for the system and when we write the mutual information expression in an upper bounded we find um, this value actually which is very similar to a 2 by 2 MIMO um, channel capacity and hence um, because it's very similar we obtain the trade-off for the 2 by 2 MIMO. Is there, are you I'm going through the clustered case. Mm -hmm. I'm here I'm talking about the clustered case um, and clustered case assumes this one. Okay. So when we put all of them together, the bounds, we see that the cooperative system has the multiplexing gain limitation 1. But for multiplexing gains up to 1, the clustered system can imitate a MIMO, but it will never be able to achieve the multiplexing gains um, larger than 1. So um, for, for the non-clustered system, I don't go through the details, but we already know that it behaves like a transmit antenna array or a receive antenna array. So that what we obtain is 1 by 3 MIMO behavior. You just do the cut sets, right? That's coming. Okay. This is just the upper bound. Right? The upper mm -hmm. So even the upper bound, yeah. the, the relays are full duplex, even the upper bound, it says that the clustered system can never fully be a MIMO. It is multiplexing gain limited. It's because actually there is only one source in your system. That is one of the reasons. Because um, even if uh, you are communicating with a relay, you are doing this through a finite capa capacity link. So the relay is willing to help you, but first, in order to make the relay help you, you need to, you have to tell the relay what to send. So it's already consuming all your multiplexing gain resources. So if you're, uh, if you're, if the relay is send sending something new, you first have to s send it to the relay, and that's very uh, resourceful. Um, to achieve this, um, uh, achieve the upper bounds for the non-clustered and the clustered cases, uh, we uh, we use the um, relaying protocol suggested in Cover and Al Gamal's um, paper in uh, from 1979. Um, so for the non-clustered case, it is enough that both relays do decode and forward, and um, for the um, for the clustered case, the first relay uh, has to do decode and forward, and the second relay has to do compress and forward. The compress and forward uh, protocol uh, here is a Weiner's diff type compression, so it's not just simple compression. It assumes that the and actually that Weiner's diff compression here is essential. If you remove um, that uh, conditioning on the side information, then um, this um, th the protocol would be suboptimal. Um, so it it is the basic um, the the decode on forward and compress on forward protocol together is the well-known um, block Marco encoding backward decoding um, structure. Um, so for both non-clustered and clustered cases, when you do the high SNR analysis, uh, whatever upper bounds I, um, the upper bounds I showed in the slide, uh, you can prove that they are achievable. 
So um, actually, you asked me uh, what is the reason. Uh, so uh, I, I and I said that there is only one source, and it it is limited by multiplexing gain. So uh, this is this is the intuitive explanation to it. But I also uh, we also wanted to uh, see if that is really the case. So we also investigated um, other scenarios. For example, the first one is the uh, compound multiple access to channel. Say we have two sources. Okay, the relay was relay. It didn't have any information to send on its own. What if it was a uh, it was a second source? Would the system perform better? So instead of having one source destination pair and two relays, let's assume there are two sources and two destinations. Basically, this system then uh, will only be different from a MIMO because the channels between uh, f the first source and the second source and the first destination and the second destination will be finite capacity links. So even in that case, uh, in the compound multiple access channel case, you see that actually uh, the same performance persists because um, the first destination and the second destination, they are both interested in the same information. And they are both, again, multiplexing gain limited by one. So, um, okay, your source side uh, is limiting because there is only one source. But even if you put two sources in your system, then your receiver side becomes uh, limiting if you have, if you demand the same information to be received from both of your destinations. Okay, then there is one more, um, uh, one more limitation we could remove from the system. Compound multiple access channels require that both destinations are interested in both, uh, both messages, both sources sent. What if they are just interested in their, um, in their own information and, um, th and the system is not a compound multiple access channel but a cooperative interference channel. Um, and in that case, actually, the cut set bounds, if you use them, they are very loose. Yeah? Um, it's just the interference channel. So this one, S1 um, sends message, say, M1, uh, and destination 1 wants to decode only M1. Okay, and uh, the second source um, sends message M2, and this wants to uh, decode M2, but uh, uh, and it's not interested in M1. But of course, source one and uh, source two are um, transmitting at the same time. The, uh, each other's message um, acts like an interference to each other. But because I'm talking about a cooperative system, um, these um, when, for example, source two transmits. Uh, source one hears that information, and similarly, source one's message, source two uh, hears. So everyone hears everyone else. So I guess in that sense, you can call it even your compound Mac is a cooperative compound Mac. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. If, uh, exactly. No, I, I don't see the difference. Uh, you you said that they hear each other. That's okay. But are they cooperating? They code explicitly to. Yeah, but they only decode the their own. They care about their own, but they hope they to help each other to be She hasn't said help they could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She just said she allows them to listen. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, sorry about that. I thought this slide to be a short part, but I think I... I want to go back one slide. Mm -hmm. Can you give an intuitive reason for why for the clustered case uh, decoding forward won't achieve that you'd like to? Mm -hmm, good point. Uh, because, first of all, think about it. It is a clustered <coughs> system. If the first relay were able to decode itself, then the destination would be able to do the same. They are in the same cluster. Their performance is very similar. So when you're decoding, you're, you're putting a hard decision uh, constraint, a hard decoding constraint on the relay. So relay uh, before decoding is like a receiver itself. So there is, and for this purpose, let's assume um, the source and the first relay have a perfect channel in between. So it's the two antenna transmitter. Um, and in this case, um, the first relay will be able to decode, and it's a two by one system. And the other one is also a two by one system. And two, two, two times one uh, MIMO systems is not equal to a two by two MIMO. Yeah, so for the cooperative interference case, actually, um, Hosmatsen and Nosratinia show that even in this system, multiplexing gain is limited by one. So. The cooperative system, no matter tricks you do, uh, is always multiplexing gain limited by one. So it will never be a, uh, it will never uh, m behave like a full MIMO system. The finite capacity links in your sort, uh, in your transmit cluster and the receive cluster is crucial for this case. Um, 
So you could say even in the Monty antenna case, they would be multiplexing limited. Okay. That's coming. <laughs> so, so the crucial problem there is that the receivers are, are individual. Have they been able to code their is that the problem? Or do you say no, 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 it really is the, it's, it's the, it's the problems with the transmitter side? I think that the present is always in the MIMO. MIMO to acting as receiver or transmit, I mean, there's no link between them. But over in this case, there's some finite capacity in between the transmitter and the relay, which is now saying it's like an antenna of the MIMO system. But there is some link, there's still some finite capacity. What the transmitter receiver? So that's why I mean. for the receivers for the interference case for the receiver side, I'm not quite sure. But my guess is, again, it's the receiver's limitation because um, because for the multiple antenna systems, actually, um, the multiple access behavior is optimal for high multiplexing gains. Uh, so when you're when let's say when you have a two times two MIMO behavior, I, I mean, when you just have a two times two MIMO, and if you want to operate at uh, in the range between multiplexing gain one and two, then actually you don't need the cooperation between, uh, between your two antennas. They can just send independent information, and then uh, you will get the performance. So that's why my guess is the receiver side is more crucial uh, to achieve the high multiplexing gain region. Um, so um, now we're at the point for the second example. Um, now we will assume multiple antenna nodes will have one relay. Actually, um, we will never get to that point, but our aim is to study a uh, large network with multiple relays. Everyone has multiple antennas. So first, we study this problem uh, after the first example. So. Um, uh, in this in this talk, I'll only assume some fixed antenna numbers. Actually, our results generalize to multiple antenna numbers at the source, at the relay, or at the destination. Um, but uh, for this talk, I'll assume both the source and the destination will have two antennas each, and the relay in the, sy in the first system will have a single antenna, and in the second um, relay, uh, in the second system, it's going to have two antennas. And for these two scenarios, we will be comparing decode and forward and compress and forward protocols. Um, of course, we will first find an upper bound and then uh, present some achievability results and, and see if these, uh, the upper bound and the achievability meet. Uh, so to find an upper bound, uh, we again write the cut set mutual informations uh, and then uh, find the behavior. So when the first system is non-clustered, it's very obvious that uh, both, uh, both cut sets um, result in the same diversity multiplexing trade-off, which is 2 times 3 MIMO behavior given in this um, figure. Um, and uh, the code on forward, uh, we assume when the relay is full duplex uh, and the receivers have perfect channel state information, um, there is block Marco encoding and backward decoding happening. And when you look at the decode on forward performance, you see that it is suboptimal. Actually, this is a surprising result because when every, when each node has a single antenna, the code on forward is optimal. The upper bound is two times one MIMO behavior, and the code on forward achieves it when the relay is full duplex. But when you add more antennas into the system, this is no longer the case. Actually, um, the intuitive explanation uh, for this uh, for this uh, result is this: Think about the uh, MIMO system, uh, m times n. For every additional multiplexing gain. Um, you uh, you add into the system. Actually, it's as if you are deleting a transmit antenna from the transmitter and a receive antenna from the receiver, and you observe <laughs> a shifted n minus one n minus one behavior. With respect to diversity, I mean you're removing an antenna with respect to the diversity. Part. That's what you mean. For every additional multiplexing gain. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, for example, you're uh, operating at multiplexing gain R, which is in between 0 and 1, and you decide to operate at R plus 1. So it's as if you're operating at uh, M minus 1 times N minus 1 MIMO, but it is shifted by multiplexing gain 1. And, if, and here will be 1 plus R. So 
it, it means that the decoding constraint at the receiver for every additional multiplexing gain is removing an antenna from, from your receiver. So here, for every additional multiplexing gain, um, we need to delete an antenna from both the relay and the destination because the relay has to do a hard decision on its own. So for multiplexing gains larger than one, actually it won't be able to decode anything. So it's not, it's not participating in the cooperation um, at all. And also because the multiplexing gain has increased by one, I need to erase an antenna from, from the destination too. So what I'm left with is actually, um, of course, I'm deleting from the source too, just like in the MIMO case. So I'm only left with one source antenna and one destination antenna shifted by multiplexing gain one. So that is the trade-off I see here from one to zero, but shifted by one, which is the just one, one, yeah, one, my, one SISO behavior you obtain, single input, single output behavior. So decode and forward in multiple, when you have large antenna numbers, the hard decision constraint is so crucial uh, I mean, so um, detrimental that it's going to uh, degrade your system performance very much. No, so it in fact goes back to what the source and destination would have between each other at that point. There was no relay, that's what you said. Yeah, Be because for every additional multiplexing gain, this acts like a destination on its own. So delete its antenna, delete one from source, delete from destination. This problem doesn't happen in, uh, when uh, everyone has a single antenna because it never goes above multiplexing gain one. Um, but if you have, uh, instead of decode and forward, if you uh, perform compress and forward, again, Weiner's zip type, um, then uh, um, uh, you would be able to obtain, um, <coughs> obtain the optimal diversity multiplexing um, trade-off channels. Uh, so, so, so I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, so, is there any? Th suppose I put as many. Suppose it's a perfect system. Right? Number of antennas at the source are the same as number of antennas at the destination is the same as the number of antennas at the relay. So you really don't gain anything in multiplexing again. That you that is why. Gain, do you even gain in diversity? That is coming. Because the first system, the relay, has, oh, okay, less, sorry, sorry. has okay. less number of antennas than the degrees of freedom between the source and the destination. And the second system is we investigate it's to answer question. those kind of um, um, problems. So um, uh, to perform compression forward, we, uh, we have to do Weiner's if type of compression. Of course, that requires the relay to know its own channel gains as well as the destination's channel gains and the channel gain in between the relay and the destination. Um, this might seem a little uh, unfair towards uh, decode and forward, but actually if you give this channel information to the relay uh, as well in the decode and forward protocol, then um, you can show that the decode and forward protocol wouldn't improve. So um, in that sense, it's a fair comparison, I should say. And for, of course, um, you can do a higher SNR analysis and show that compress and forward is actually optimal. So uh, compress and forward works in this case because it is a soft information transmission. Okay, it's doing some compression, adding some compression noise, but that compression noise is not as uh, deteriorating the performance as um, the hard decision you do, um, as in the decode and forward case. Um, so I said, um, in, the fir in the first problem, uh, we uh, motivated um, uh, clustering, so we also look at the uh, same problem uh, when it is clustered. So, uh, of course, the second uh, cut set mutual information doesn't change, hence the uh, diversity multiplexing trade of upper bound, but the first one changes because um, from when we write the cut set mutual information for this cut set, we observe that actually um, the, uh, the, that mutual information is larger than a particular additive white Gaussian noise channel capacity. So again, uh, we don't have any outage for multiplexing gains up to one, and um, hence um, the diversity multiplexing trade-off is a vertical line. But for larger multiplexing gains, uh, we obtain um, we obtain uh, the two times three MIMO behavior. Um, and uh, when we look at the, uh, when we compare decode and forward and compress and forward, of course compress and forward is optimal because it was even uh, optimal for the non-clustered case. 
Uh, but we, for the decode and forward, we observe that actually clustering is beneficial for the decode and forward uh, protocol when the multiplexing gains are small because um, the channel um, between the source and the relay is very favorable. So for multiplexing gains up to one, the relay almost never um, does any error in decoding. Um, so um, what, if we cluster, then the decode and forward protocol improves it for low multiplexing gains. But again, even if it has a AWGN channel be in between itself and the source, above multiplexing gains one, it cannot do anything. And again, the diversity multiplexing trade-off for decode and forward is limited by the direct um, transmission behavior. Um, I think that that is a reasonable assumption. I mean, um, those two antennas uh, are close to each other, so. Um, <coughs> yeah. Those distances are very close to each other, so. Within the cluster, the assumption is the gains are the same, or for each one of those. Actually, it is uh, because that's what limits the multiplexing gain. Yeah, because if you change the rank of that channel, um, if you if it had more antennas, if you change the rank, that would be different. But. It is, I think, for um, MIMO editor white Gaussian, for MIMO Ricean channels, um, rank one, I, I mean, th this model comes from the Ricean case, right? Yeah, right, right. Uh, when the gain is very high. Yeah. So the, um, the ones which are rank one are um, a significant portion of the literature. So I think it's, if, if you change the rank, rank of that channel, you need to modify the analysis. If, for example, if you, you can add up more antennas, M, N, and 2, and um, then, then everything will modify accordingly. And if your, rate, if your multiplexing gain is larger than 2, then the code and forward wouldn't work. Um, so returning um, to your coming, coming to your question, uh, we, uh, we start studying the second system because we say that, okay, the, co um, the code and forward is suboptimal, but what if the number of antennas it has is equal to the uh, degrees of freedom in between um, the, so uh, the degree to degrees of freedom between the source and the destination? Would, would this improve the performance? Actually, it is not because uh, it does not improve the performance. The reason is exactly the same. For the MIMO system, I said that for every additional multiplexing gain we, uh, we want to operate at, we need to um, kind of um, delete an antenna from the transmitter, from the relay, and from the receiver. So the same thing happens. So for every additional multiplexing gain I want to operate at, source loses an antenna, relay loses an antenna, and the destination loses an antenna. And I'm left with one times two um, SIMO system. W and here is the diversity multiplexing trade-off we observe from two to um, zero and um, in the multiplexing gain range from one to two. And um, you can show that compress and forward um, is optimal. It's kind of funny that you see when I decide to decode it was an antenna. I think it is kind of a little bit oversimplifying, but that is that is the explanation of the decode and uh, the diversity multiplexing trade-off. It is. I compress and all, I do some linear math. Yeah. Well, once you decode, you're sort of, there's no more math. Exactly. And those losing and erasing antennas, it's, it's in the diversity multiplexing trade-off expression itself. It, it is all so shifted behavior. When you talk about these, everything here is large as an R. Right. Yeah. And then you sort of say that I have a cluster and then I have another cluster. Yeah. They're distant but large as uh, yeah. I guess it's a different model. One is Rayleigh and the other one is uh, Gaussian. You know? Inter cluster you have Rayleigh. Yes. And within cluster you have Gaussian. 
Yeah, but I could have done everything for a Vicean channel. Um, and thinking that every node, each, each, each two, every two nodes will have um, a certain Ricean factor, K. Right. And then I could have done the analysis for that, too. So, it's, it's more scattering, and though it's high, it's not, it's more scattering. So, just the non-trusting, the Raleigh model, it's more scattering. So, so I don't know, I think the way to interpret the highest scenarios, in, in practice, you can get most of this diversity reasonably uh, uh, practical as normal. So I think that's just a mathematical tool. Well, you know. Sometimes you cannot, so I, I don't know. You, you there don't was a, I think there's a line of research which discusses how big is the largest in our. Yeah. That's sometimes true. you need a lot, sometimes yeah. you need a little. That is true. And uh, Holiday <laughs> actually discussed that. Yeah, yeah. Then I was good. Yeah, and um, actually, if you if you really go to the channel model, then um, I say these are additive white Gaussian noise when they are closer than the threshold distance epsilon. But what is that threshold distance epsilon? It is very highly geometry dependent. Um, I mean, in in one neighborhood, uh, in in a rural area, that epsilon is going to be something, and in Manhattan, it's going to be something. So. <laughs> I agree that that is um, theoretical work, but it is true to some extent. As long as you as you understand, right? <laughs> so um, now we uh, we can study the second system when the second uh, when the relay has uh, two antennas in uh, when it is clustered. So um, we we look at the first cut set and we see that. Mm, this um, this is a MIMO editor white Gaussian noise channel. So when that MIMO editor white Gaussian noise channel is rank one, then for multiplexing gains larger than one, um, we will have a certain behavior. And for multiplexing gains less than one, the relay will be able to decode perfectly, and there won't be any outage. So we have this vertical behavior here, and for multiplexing gains larger than one, we observe two times three MIMO behavior. Because it is rank one, it's as if the relay has one antenna. So that's why we observe two times three behavior um, for multiplexing gains larger than one. And the second cut set is, of course, four times two MIMO. And when we put all of them together, uh, we observe that um, decode and forward, again, is, uh, is optimal uh, when multiplexing gains are small. But when multiplexing gains are large, it is suboptimal, again, with the same reasoning. But compress and forward um, is, again, achieving the upper bound. So when we put all these together, actually um, comparing non-clustered and clustered systems, there are a couple of observations. Um, first of all, um, the clustering is not always beneficial because for high multiplexing gains, it might be degrading your performance. When you look at this one, you uh, the non-clustered uh, diversity multiplexing trade-off, you see that actually you can obtain uh, larger diversity levels for the same multiplexing gain, whereas clustering um, is actually um, uh, making your performance worse. But clustering, uh, on the other hand, is advantageous because it makes the decode and forward protocol be optimal for low multiplexing gains, which is not optimal for low multiplexing gains if the system is not clustered. So, so I must have spaced out. You considered both uh, source cluster and destination cluster? No, I just, uh, for these examples, I just considered the source cluster, but the problem is symmetric, so that wouldn't make a difference. Um, so, any other questions up to this point? Um, our, um, so, until now, we assume that the relay is full duplex. And uh, we have seen that our cooperative system itself may be limiting and it may not be able to mimic a MIMO. And um, <coughs> compress and forward and decode and forward protocols might be very different from each other when nodes have multiple antennas. Um, but we assume the relay is full duplex. So let's remove that assumption uh, going to more practical networks and assume the relay is half duplex. Um, so all the half duplex uh, analysis, all the, half du uh, the, all the literature on half duplex cooperative systems consider um, single antenna terminals. And um, <coughs> for example, um, for and uh, diversity multiplexing trade-off analysis has been also done for this problem. For example, uh, 
non-orthogonal amplify on forward protocol was suggested, or dynamic decode on forward uh, protocol was suggested by Hesham Al Gamal uh, Azarian and um, Kambiz Azarian. Um, but um, in the non-orthogonal amplify on forward protocol, source transmits for the whole time and relay um, listens for half of the time and then transmits in the other half. Um, but it is shown to be suboptimal. And dynamic decode and forward, in the dynamic case, the relay listens until it can reliably decode. And after that, it transmits. Um, so uh, because the channel between the source and the relay um, is, <coughs> is fading, that um, time instant when the relay decodes is random, hence the name dynamic comes. But even for high multiplexing gains, dynamic decode and forward is shown to be suboptimal. So no half duplex protocol, um, relaying protocol is known to achieve the upper bound. And actually, um, multiple antenna systems are not investigated in this problem either. So um, that's why we look at this problem when source relay and the destination have arbitrary number of antennas. And uh, we write the cut set mutual information expressions and find, uh, find a diversity multiplexing trade of upper bound. So. Um, <coughs> First of all, well, so after writing these mutual information expressions, the diversity multiplexing trade-off we achieve, um, the, the uh, diversity multiplexing trade-off of the system is upper bounded um, by um, the, uh, the diversity multiplexing trade-offs we write for these cut sets, but it's a function of t. Um, so for every, uh, for every particular t, you can write a uh, diversity multiplexing trade-off. And of course, you can optimize over t and make this, um, make this um, larger. But um, actually, if you want to calculate this explicitly, it is, it is a hard problem. Because um, let's look at these mutual information expressions closely. For example, the first one. So this first mutual information expression is a function of source, uh, uh, source relay link and source destination link. Whereas the second mutual information expression is a function of uh, the channel gain matrix between uh, source and the destination. So actually, um, this one, this link, um, the, the channel gain matrix for source to destination is included in both the channel gain matrices. Um, uh, so, it, it, so this one, the channel gain matrix for this one is included in this term, and here it also is present, but extra terms are uh, present in the channel gain matrix, which are from source to the relay. So these are two correlated uh, matrices, and it's very hard to find the joint eigenvalue distribution for, uh, for this. Um, the problem is very hard. But when, uh, for example, the source, uh, number of source antenna is one, then you can easily compute what this upper bound is for the source cuts it. And similarly, if the number, uh, if the destination has only one antenna, you can calculate it for um, the uh, cut set around the destination. So if you want to be able to cal calculate both, both M or N has to be one. So um, the channel, the channel gain matrix you write for this cut set, okay? Um, the, the, this first mutual information expression. Is, um, is a matrix that includes terms here and here. And the second one, the second mutual information expression has channel, uh, the channel gain matrix has terms here. So some of the, the all the terms here are, include, uh, are included in the first mutual information expression as well. And some other independent channels on top of it. I think I'll switch to this one. So when, uh, um, say, m is equal to 1, the number of uh, source antennas is equal to 1, uh, we write uh, what the, uh, uh, the diversity multiplexing trade-off is explicitly for the source cut set. And um, it says that when t is large enough, then, um, the <coughs> then what we obtain is actually the full duplex upper bound because it is 1 times n is the number of antennas the destination has, k is the number of antennas the relay has. So it is the full duplex bound. t is the time the relay listens. So of course, if, if the relay listens more, uh, for the cut set around the source, it becomes more part of uh, your receiver. So it is something advantageous. But if, you're, uh, if your t does not satisfy this condition, then you get a piecewise linear um, function. 
For example, when we write the cut set mutual information, the cut set when the diversity multiplexing trade-off um, for the case when both m and n is equal to one, say k is equal to two, we get this picture. For example, um, um, th this this one shows uh, shows the case for uh, for the cut set around um, the source. So if t is larger than two over three, then we are on um, on this one. Uh, we can operate here, and if t is larger, uh, is, is less than or equal to two thirds, then we can operate here. But the problem is there is also the other cut set, which will demand just the opposite, which is uh, which is going to say one minus t is larger than two thirds, which will mean um, t should be less than one third. So one of your cut sets says that t should be larger than two thirds to be optimal, and the other cut set says that t should be less than one third uh, to be optimal which won't be satisfied uh, simultaneously. So uh, optimizing over both, you actually need to operate at t is equal to 1 half. And uh, what will you, uh, you will end up having this diversity multiplexing trade-off upper bound. So actually, when you, ha when you look into multiple antenna terminals um, and the half duplex relay case, actually, the diversity multiplexing trade-off might be, is in general tighter than the full duplex bound. And this was not a problem when every, um, every uh, node had a single antenna, because in that case, one cut set says t should be larger than or equal to one half, and the other one says t should be less than or equal to one half, and one half is optimal. And in order to achieve that upper bound, um, again, we assume that the relay does uh, Weiner's zip type compression. Okay, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so how would you compare that result for the single antenna case with dynamic exactly match? I'm sorry? Uh, so we go back a slide, right? I mean, this is all decoded forward, right? But no, this is the upper bound. I'm trying oh, to sorry, calculate sorry, sorry. the upper bound. Sorry. But even in, so the upper bound says t should be half? Yeah, yeah because... So, okay, because the bounds are anyway different for the upper bound. One cut set demands one thing. Oh, it is symmetric. Yeah. So to achieve this upper bound, uh, you need to do uh, compress and forward and for, okay, to, to cal the upper bound is hard to calculate because, uh, because, um, uh, because of the channel situations I explained, but actually uh, you can prove that for any M, N, or K, compress and forward is optimal. Can you explain the compress and forward? <laughs> sure. Um, so, um, the destination here is both the source and um, and the relay, right? So the relay needs to um, needs to uh, compress its information and send it to the destination. But if if it uh, disregards um, the uh, the signal that the destination receives from the source, it can compress uh, at a higher rate. Uh, but actually, the destination has more uh, more information about what the relay is trying to compress, which is the side information available to it um, through the uh, through the source. So, um, so it, uh, the relay, by knowing all the channel state information available in the system, it can compress its information more, um, conditioning on what destination has already received. That's I sort of understand, but. What I'm not clear about is on the code word level, mm -hmm. or is that too much to explain? No. I think I can explain it later I because, um, yeah, that's why I didn't include those slides. <laughs> so our last example is the multiple access relay channel. And it was first considered in uh, the paper by Kramer, Gaspar, and Gupta in 2005. And uh, we also assume the half duplex relay operation here. And uh, when you look at the uh, diversity multiplexing trade-off, uh, we observe um, these. Um, first of all, uh, the, um, the circles show the upper bound. And uh, the green line is the decode and forward uh, protocol. Uh, dynamic decode and forward, so it is suboptimal for high multiplexing gains. And uh, actually, um, multiple axis amplify on forward, which is basically amplify on forward done for two sources, is optimal for, for high multiplexing gains. But we are just curious uh, to see how compress and forward behaves in this case. And um, 
we look at uh, the performance and we see that for low multiplexing gains, actually, for compression forward protocol, the single user error behavior is dominant. So uh, in order to achieve this performance, um, we need to uh, make the uh, system operate like this. In the first half of the time, source one transmits and then uh, relay compresses and forwards only first source's information. And in the second half, um, the uh, relay compresses and um, sends second source's information. And we obtain this part. And for high multiplexing gains, both users being an error is the dominant error event we observe. And that's why both sources can transmit at the same time and um, the relay can simultaneously compress both sources together. And um, we can obtain optimal behavior for high multiplexing gains. Um, the problem uh, here, the actually compress and forward will be optimal for uh, any antenna combinations whenever uh, the multiple, um, whenever decoding both users in error is a dominant error event. Although this analysis shows the case when everyone has a single antenna, the optimal behavior uh, for the relay is going to persist whenever that is the case. But for example, um, although here multiple access amplify on forward uh, is also optimal, it is very hard to um, to show that you can extend the result for multiple antenna case. For example, I, I know um, Jean-Claude Belfiore, he has uh, worked on multiple antenna amplify on forward diverse to multiplexing trade-off. And um, the whatever, uh, in the literature, the best you can get is a bound on uh, multiple, uh, multiple antenna amplify on forward cases, but it's hard to calculate the actual behavior. So, um, it, it's, and the, you know, when I conclude the diversity multiplexing trade-off part of my talk, I should say, um, we uh, studied a cooperative system from uh, um, a cooperative system and compared it to a MIMO system, um, in, and we did that at high SNR. And uh, we observed that um, a MIMO system and a cooperative system is not all, are not always equal, and uh, the this. Um, and how close a cooperative system can uh, get close to a MIMO system depends on the location of the nodes. And when nodes have multiple, antenna, uh, multiple antennas, then the single antenna results do not generalize. The uh, knowledge we have about decode and forward and compress and forward uh, differentiate with each other. Uh, and um, compress and forward uh, maintains to be optimal, whereas uh, decode, decode and forward is not. And for half duplex systems, uh, actually, um, until now, all half, du half duplex systems use the full duplex bound. Uh, but actually, if we are studying half duplex systems, we should use the tighter half duplex bound for that one. Um, any questions up to this point? So can I take 10 minutes longer? So um, this um, here, uh, I will go on to the security aspects of uh, uh, of the uh, cooperative systems. Um, secrecy in communications um, is actually uh, studied um, since 1975. I don't know if it was a continuous study since then. Actually, I should start it with 1949, right, with Shannon. Um, but actually, his was more, um, I think, that work was more um, computer science oriented with the secret keys and everything. Weiner's, um, he, he uh, investigates this information theoretic um, secrecy in the presence of a passive listener. So uh, you are trying to communicate with a third party in the presence of a passive listener, and you want that uh, listener to understand as, uh, as little as possible. Uh, and, of course, you still want to maintain a reliable transmission over your um, main link. And um, the performance measures for this system is the legitimate uh, links rate. Um, you want to operate as high rate as possible. And uh, equivocation rate at the wiretapper. So you want the uh, wiretapper to know as little as possible, as confused. Uh, you want him to be very, very confused about your communication. <laughs> so in the Weiner setup, this uh, happens like this. Source transmits its information. Um, the, ch the channel is like this. We assume the wiretapper has a, uh, its channel is worse than the decoder's channels. Otherwise, the secrecy capacity uh, will be zero, which I will mention uh, now. 
Um, actually, and this should be a union sign. I'm sorry about that. Um, the capacity equivocation rate region uh, typically looks like this. Um, of course, um, the rate you can achieve is bounded by the mutual information between your source and the destination. This is just the, uh, what we know for, uh, for direct ring communications anyways. The equivocation rate is, uh, is upper bounded by this uh, mutual information difference. The this is the mutual information you obtain in your direct link, and this is the mutual information uh, from your source to the wiretapper. And uh, so the region uh, looks like this, and um, the way to achieve it is this. You use a code book structure of this size, and the, this, uh, this code book has a total of 2 to the power n times mutual information x, y um, code words. So basically, the the, uh, your legitimate decoder is able to decode every single code word in this code book structure. But, um, uh, but you put... Um, you place your code words in such a way that um, A times B is equal to 2 to the power N times um, mutual information X, Y, but B is equal to mutual inf uh, 2 to the power N mutual information uh, between X and Z, the wiretapper's uh, signal. So whenever you want to send a code word um, 1 to A, uh, which is um, 2 to the power N times this amount, then uh, you pick a code word to send that securely. You just pick a um, pick that row, and then you just pick one random code word out of that, and then send that. So because there are uh, because there uh, the number of uh, columns in this code book is equal to the two to the power n times mutual information uh, from your source to the wiretapper, then your wiretapper can only decode. Um, the code in the, your code word across columns, but it won't be able to decode it across rows. So um, it will be confused about the information you send. Is um, I hope. Do you have any questions about this part? Because I'm going to use that result. Um, so um, that um, direct channel case with the wiretapper is well established, and we would like to study the relay channel with a wiretapper. So. Um, <coughs> We assume this, there is this relay channel, and the wiretapper receives a um, <coughs> receives a um, worse version than the decoder. The wiretapper is physically degraded. Then um, the achievable region for uh, for this one uh, is actually um, the achievable rate equivocation rate region for this problem is given by this region. Um, so this line is actually pretty straightforward. That is the decode and forward uh, achievable rate for the relay channel. And equivocation rate is the difference between that mu the minimum of these two mutual informations minus this value. I think at this point it is interesting to see, uh, to understand why we subtract this value from, um, <coughs> from uh, that minimum. It's, w this means that actually whenever the relay is transmitting, it's also helping the wiretapper. So uh, we don't, uh, the relay always um, acts as a part of the, uh, as a transmitter, and it's always uh, facilitating the communication to the wiretapper. I think that's, that's an interesting observation. So in order to achieve this, just, uh, mm -hmm. uh, T is the wiretapper. Yes. Uh, and so you know, you would have this relay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Depending on the achievability, I will just explain now. Okay, but it's for, it's a, so I heard Lalita say that we're degraded. Yeah. There's, it's still, there's a, Why some kind of a degraded Why, the, the wire tepper is degraded. The, the wire tepper just simply gets a degraded version of whatever uh, the destination receives. Mm -hmm. okay. The degradedness show, was shown on the previous slide? Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> So um, actually, the code book structure is very similar um, to the basic relay um, channel code book structure. You, you're, you just, uh, for the secrecy systems, you, whatever code books you're talking about, you just start thinking about them in two dimensions. And um, 
and you're not using all of your code words to transmit new information, but uh, but you just uh, randomize. Whenever you want to send a code word, you randomize it, uh, make it equivocal with uh, other other code words, and then send pick one out of it and then send it and make it um, that way secure. So the same thing happens here. The relay generates a code book. Um, <coughs> Uh, which has A times B many code words. And for every relay code word, the um, source generates a code book, again, uh, with A times B code words. And um, for example, in the first block, um, the relay chooses the, uh, chooses the first, uh, the default code word, which is one. And um, source, let's say, wants to transmit an information here. And um, if, if it wants to operate at a full secrecy, um, at uh, the secrecy, um, the perfect secrecy rate, then um, it uses all these uh, B blocks to randomize its information, picks one out randomly, and transmits that information. So this B block is not the same as the block Marco B block? No, it's the same. So you just send, you're scrambling your messages? Is that what you're doing? For this is just happening for the first block. Yeah, the first block. Mm -hmm. Are you picking something from some other block? So I'm I'm trying. Uh, no, but but think about it. If this were only a relay channel, then it wouldn't have columns like this. It would be a times have times rows only. Yeah. Okay, and every single one would be carrying some information. Now I'm trading. Um, this is uh, I'm trading the system. I'm choosing to send less information, only a secret information, and instead I'm sending some, um, and I'm blurring this message with some extra code words, and I'm sending that one out. So the relay is not randomizing? No, it's not randomizing. That's true. Um, so um, basically, relay is relaying sources, randomizing, making the message secret, and relay is decoding and forwarding well, whatever. It's fine with you randomizing once because the blur tuffer will not decode anyway. Mm -hmm. so, so the uh, source, when it, for example, when it wants to transmit W1, it just picks this row and then um, sends this code word. So the decoder will be able to decode exactly what this code word is, and then actually that, that code word would not mean something, but its row is going to give the information. And, um, and that's how the communication happens. But actually, if you do not want to operate at the perfect secrecy rate, but if you want less secrecy in your system, then instead, uh, instead of um, randomizing through the whole row, you can just uh, make it uh, into, uh, you can uh, actually put, consider each row as uh, the combination of, uh, combination of subsets. And for example, in order to send uh, the code word that corresponds to these three code words, uh, then you can pick one out randomly um, from this set and send that one. This way, actually, um, the, the wiretapper will be able to decode some information because the wiretapper can decode which, which uh, column the message is from. It will be able to say if it is from the first subset or from the second subset. So it will, some information will leak to, to the wiretapper. No, um, the decoder will be able to decode everything because the total number of code words in this code book is equal to the um, number of code words that the direct link can support. So the decoder will always re reliably decode what the code word is. But um, the wiretapper will be able to decode what column the information is from because only uh, the, the number of rows is equal to uh, this much. So it only can decode the column information. Um, so well, the, what is interesting about this is um, uh, we also look at the Gaussian case, and for the achievability uh, part, we assume um, we assume this structure at uh, at the source. Actually, it says that um, here we assume uh, alpha is the coherent combining gain between the source and um, and the relay, just like in the regular relay channel. But we also introduce another um, another variable, which is gamma, which says that uh, which shows the participation level of uh, of the relay. So it's not it's not necessarily optimal for the relay to transmit all its 
Um, so um, we've, uh, when you just uh, substitute the values, uh, you find the achievable region uh, to be um, to be like this. Actually, this one makes more sense than the mutual information expressions. So um, here, in this case, we assume uh, both the source and um, the source and the relay have 7 dB power uh, power levels. And um, if you use only direct transmission, so if you do not have a relay in the system, then your capacity uh, your capacity equivocation region is uh, is this region. But if you choose uh, to use a relay. Uh, and the noise level at your relay is equal to one. Your total noise level uh, at the uh, here for this simulation, we assume the total noise level at the destination is four, and uh, at the wiretapper, it is uh, the noise variance is equal to five. And in that case, you, know, you observe that the achievable equivocation rate uh, rate region is this blue region, and we observe the optimal coherent combining gain is equal to 0.75. And for this case, the relay operates with full power because the relay is not very noisy, and uh, it can easily decode and it can um, forward that information um, to the wiretapper. But say the relay is noisier, so uh, in this case, we assume the noise variance in seven and at wiretapper it's equal to eight. And in this case, um, the <coughs> the uh, equivocation rate, rate region we obtain is this one. But what is interesting is um, the optimal gamma value, the relay participation level, is 0 0.58, which is much less than 1. So um, because this, is, this happens because uh, you want to use the relay whenever its contribution to the destination is more than its contribution um, to, the, um, to the wiretapper. You don't want to use the relay blindly. Um, but of course, um, this is an open problem uh, because this is just an achievable scheme. Um, any what other uh, achievable schemes you can look into the uh, look in um, look for in this problem uh, that might do better. So it's degraded and still you, it's not that easy to find the uh, capacity region. Yeah, I tried hard. So, so like you know, in the in the relay channel, you have source and relay, and they coherently combine at the destination. How about the wire tap? Mm-hmm. Do they coherently combine the wire tapper too or not? Um, I don't know the details of it, but uh, I think they don't all, always want to add coherently because. Yeah, but how would you know this is degraded? A slightly different question, right? Which is you know, normally there is this coherent. I'll try asking this question again. Normally there is this coherent combining game, right? And now he asks you, well, what is the degradedness of the relay? Like, do you get the same? Is it just that, well, we're, I guess you, I think you still, like you don't, you don't have any notion, right, that, oh, you can coherently combine at the destination and not be coherently combining at the relay. Right, so the like relay, the relay is just giving an, an extra added noise term. Right, that's mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. So you would coherently combine at the, the, the wire top too. Yeah. It'd just be noisy, that's all. Yeah. So that doesn't make sense. Some <laughs> other, there's some other advantage there. Actually, they're not rectangular, but when you, I mean, you have to zoom into the picture really hard to see the, uh, <coughs> and see the concave region that I've shown in that generic uh, capacity equivocation rate region. So uh, I, I, I was able to see the, um, the concavity here when I zoomed in many, many, many times. <laughs> <laughs> and um, 
this one is rounded. This one is rectangular. Um, I think that is um, Hellman's result, um, and he shows that the Gaussian inputs optimize the capacity equivocation rate region. So the uh, the input distribution that optimizes your um, direct channel capacity is the same with the one that maximizes your secrecy capacity. Um, so that's why uh, for the direct one, for the Gaussian case, that one is rectangular. So so we. Can you prove that Gaussian is optimal for this problem? For I, I tried really hard. I found two different so bounds. it's not clear that mm -mm. Gaussian is optimal either. That's true. I could, I could be, I could also explain. Maybe if you didn't do Gaussian, maybe, I don't, you won't have coherent combining and stuff. Mm-hmm. So, um, in the second part, we looked into this uh, cooperative system uh, in the presence of a wiretapper, and uh, we found, I didn't talk about the outer bounds in this, uh, in this talk, but we actually established inner and outer bounds on the capacity equivocation rate region. And um, we show that uh, for the Gaussian case, it's not always beneficial to use the relay uh, with full power. It, the problem uh, is just more than a relay channel. Uh, so, and um, the future work, um, for example, here we have the assumption that the uh, wiretapper is, uh, is degraded, but what if it, uh, the channels are just less noisy or are more, more capable? Do you really need that degradedness assumption? And, um, um, and also, uh, that is the condition on the wiretapper. Also, uh, can you do more? Um, can you find some regions when the relay is degraded and um, source relay destination channel? Um, so the, the relation between the source relay destination channel and source relay wiretapper channel, how should they be related? Uh, and of course, this coherent combining and power issues. Um, there are many open problems in this area. Yeah, so thank you and I'm sorry for taking longer.